comes from John's Gospel. Fourth chapter, verses 1 to 26. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds. And Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And he told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, some days she wondered why she even bothered to get out of bed. Most of the time she felt as if one day was just the same as the next. Nothing new, nothing different. She didn't know exactly how she had gotten to where she was. And she certainly had no idea what her future might look like from here. Chances are it would be just more of the same. Day after day, night after night. Her life was not what she had expected. Not what she had planned. After all, she didn't start out to be married and divorced five times. She also didn't start out to live with a man that she was not married to, a man that had no intention of marrying her, a man that knew all too well her past history and the marriages that she had been in, a man that frequently reminded her that she was not worth marrying, a man that reminded her all too often of how he had been doing her a favor by taking her in a man that reminded her frequently that she had nowhere else to turn 
and nowhere else to go because she was not and never would be good enough. She wonders to herself what exactly had happened for her to end up trapped in the life that she was living. Try as she might, she was just not exactly sure. She tried to remember, but sometimes it's hard to pinpoint where your life starts to unravel, where things went wrong. If she had known what was happening at the time, perhaps she could have fixed it, changed it somehow. Perhaps her life could have been different than it was now. Instead, here she was, daydreaming as she made her way to the well in the hardest, hottest part of the day, berating herself once again for all of the mistakes that she made that had put her in this sorry position. Slowly as she approached the well, she could see someone already there. She squinted her eyes against the glare of the sun, but still did not recognize who it was. Surely no one else would be out in the heat if they did not have to be. Noon was when everyone made sure to be inside and out of the sun. She would have been too, except that she was not able to do things that were easy and simple. Not any longer. Now she was not able to do the normal things such as get water as everyone else did. Such a simple thing that most people take for granted were things that she no longer could. Even things as simple as coming to this well for water. She had found that she could not come in the cool of the morning and the evening as the other women did. Instead, she had to come in the heat of the day at noontime in order to avoid the other women. Days of the other women laughing and taunting her, even pinching her as she brushed past them, had finally taken their toll on her self-esteem. So now she had no choice but to come when she knew that others would not be there. As she came closer to the well, she again noticed the man leaning against the stone wall. He was dusty. His face was flushed red from the heat. He looked exhausted, as if he had been walking for miles and had finally just dropped to rest against the wall. He was someone that she had not seen before. In fact, he was dressed as a Jew. But surely a Jew would not come through Samaria. She, a Samaritan woman, knew the strained history between the Jews and the Samaritans. Half-breed and dog were common names that the Jews taunted the Samaritans with. Of mixed blood between the Assyrians and the Jews, the Samaritans were now hated by the Jews. The Jews' hate for them came from the scripture passage in Deuteronomy where God had told the Jews not to marry or intermingle with foreigners. But when the Assyrians had taken the Jews captive, that's what had happened. Not only was Samaritans a mixed breed of Jew, but they had their own form of religion. They did not believe that God was in the temple in Jerusalem. Every self-respecting Samaritan knew their God was on the mountain of Jerusalem, not Mount Sinai. They strongly believed that they and not the Jews were the bearers of the true faith of ancient Israel. As the Jews felt that they were God's chosen, descended from the line of Judah, Samaritans felt that they were descended from Joseph. The friction between the Samaritans and the Jews were an ongoing debate, fueled by both sides. Jews would avoid the area, in fact, and often travel miles out of the way just to avoid going through Samaria. As she came closer, the man looked up and asked her for a drink from the well. She was incredulous. Surely this man, this Jew, would not be asking her, a Samaritan, for a drink. After all, no Jew would dare to drink from the same cup as a Samaritan. And she couldn't help but blurt out her thoughts, you are asking me for a drink? 
She was a Samaritan after all, and she was also a woman, not to mention her reputation. No respectable person would even speak to her. This was something else she had learned to live with, loneliness. This stranger was telling her that if she only knew the water that he had, that she would be asking him for a drink. For he had living water, and she would never thirst again. Confused, she pointed out that he had neither a bucket or a rope or anything to get the water. The man told her that if she would only ask, he would give her this living water, and it would be as a spring inside of her. Finally, she thought, an answer to my prayers. No more trips to this well. No more waiting until the heat of the day to go so as to avoid the other women. It sounded too good to be true. Please, sir, give me some of this water, she asked. He then told her to go and fetch her husband. At the word husband, shame shot through her body and heated her face to a blood red that had nothing to do with the sun. I have no husband, she whispered. True, for you have been married five times, and you now live with a man who is not your husband. At his words, she looked up into his face. Just who was this stranger, and where had he come from? Sir, I see you are a prophet. Tell me then why you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place to worship while we claim it is here where our ancestors worshipped. And Jesus replied, The time is coming when it won't matter where you worship, whether you worship the Father here or in Jerusalem, for it is not where we worship, but how we worship. Not satisfied with his answer, she replied, Well, I know the Messiah will come, and when he does, he will explain everything. Then Jesus said, I am he. You know, we often find ourselves much like this woman, don't we? we? We wake up one morning and we realize that we have made a mess of our life. We realize that the life that we are in is not the life that we had planned for ourselves. We can even admit that the person that we have become is not the person who we thought we would be. We had dreams, we had ambitions. We were going to go to school and we were going to get a good job. <coughs> We'd have a nice house and we would marry the person of our dreams, right? We would have some beautiful children and life would be great. But most of the time we end up like this woman at the well. Our life in a mess and no idea as to what happened or where we got off track. <coughs> Excuse me. It could have been because we had made some wrong choices that we thought were the right choices at the time, but that have instead changed the course of our life forever. Maybe we dropped out of school, married the person that our parents warned us to stay away from, and now here we are. No diploma, no husband, no idea how we will raise these children that we are left with. Maybe we hung out with the wrong crowd. We thought we were part of the cool group. You know, a little mischief, a little beer, a little drugs, harmless stuff. Or so we thought, until we realized that we can't stop using when we want. Instead, our mind is absorbed not only with not only uh, with that, but how we will get the next high. We soon find we can't work. Maybe we even end up doing time behind bars. <coughs> now we have a criminal record that now follows us like a shadow wherever we go. Or maybe we have been lucky. Maybe we have married our high school sweetheart only to find out that a few years and a few kids later... We feel trapped, bored. What were we thinking to get married so young? We didn't sow our wild oats. Instead, we find a sympathetic co-worker who is willing to listen and willing to tell us what we want to hear. 
Soon this sympathetic co-worker seems to understand us so much better than our spouse. Soon we take that step out onto a dark path that leads to its own kind of misery. We find ourselves willing to throw everything away and soon find ourselves like the woman at the well. Sometimes it was the choices that others made that affected us, intentionally or unintentionally. You know, times when our spouse walks out, times when we get into financial trouble. There are a million different reasons why we end up in a mess. But there we are. One morning we wake up and our mess slaps us in the face. That seems to be what happened to this woman at the well. Was it her that had chosen to leave the men she had been married to? Had she been abused and mistreated not only by one but perhaps all of them until she had to get out? Had they just maybe tired of her and tossed her aside when they decided to call it quits? Had they perhaps found that she was barren and unable to bear children? something that was frowned upon in their culture. Whatever the reason, she was not who she had intended to be. And her life was not the life that she had envisioned for herself. Living with a man who wasn't her husband, branded a harlot by the women of the town, taunted and abused for the mess that she now called her life, nowhere to turn, nowhere to go, No way to escape. This morning, she woke up thinking that this day would be the same as any other day. Fix the morning meal, do some inside chores. When the sun rose higher, she prepared to go for the water. Sure that the other women would have returned by now, unaware of the grace waiting for her at the well. Unaware of how her day was about to change how her entire life was about to change. Grace is like that. Grace shows up in the midst of our mess. Grace shows up and says, you know, just because your life is a mess doesn't mean that it has to stay a mess. Grace says just because you made mistakes and you did everything wrong doesn't mean that it can't be made right. Grace covers our mistakes. Grace covers our shame. Grace covers the mess that we have made out of everything because grace can. Grace covers it all. Grace comes down right into the middle of our mess, right where we are. We don't have to clean up our mess first. Grace plops down right in the middle of it. Dirt, shame, addictions, adultery, lies, whatever it is, grace is willing to get messy. Grace is willing to save us all. Jesus said, if you only knew the water that I have, you would ask me for a drink. If you only knew. Isn't that the whole problem? We didn't know. We didn't know the full effects of grace. We didn't know that Jesus was waiting to quench the thirst for change that we have. The thirst that we have to get out of our mess, to make our life different, to make our life better. We didn't know. We didn't know because we have instead believed all of the lies that have been told to us by society that it is impossible to change. You know, the devil too enjoys whispering in our ear in the middle of our mess. He says, what are you doing? What do you think you're doing? God doesn't love you. God wouldn't love you. Look at the mess that you have made. Let me tell you, in case you haven't heard, that way you can no longer say, I didn't know. The devil is a liar. The voices in your head are liars. The voices from those around us and in society are liars. God loves you. Jesus loves you. 
Jesus came to die for you. Jesus took that mess and gathered it up and held it while he was on the cross. Jesus came to offer salvation to the woman at the well, came to offer a gift of grace to a despised Samaritan, a half-breed, a dog, a harlot, someone who has lived her life in every way that was opposite of the way that it should have been lived. And Jesus came to offer grace, to offer us that same grace, messy grace. You see, it is when we meet Jesus that our life changes. Life changed for the woman at the well. She ran back to town, and despite how the other women had treated her, she could not help but shout about the good news, that she had found the Messiah, that he knew and could tell her everything that she had ever done. We can appropriately guess from her reaction that she accepted the living water that Jesus was offering. She tasted the cool, clear, cleansing flow of grace. That's the grace that we too are offered. Messy grace. The best kind of grace. The grace that changes everything, even our mess. Especially our mess. I imagine this woman's life was changed. Can you imagine that it was easy to start over? I bet not. I imagine that it wasn't. But the great thing is that Jesus is with her. And is it with us? You know, our scriptures say that Jesus stayed with them for a while. Jesus did not leave her, and Jesus does not leave us. He was not about to leave this woman. You see, we only need to take life one day at a time as we move out of our mess and closer to Jesus, for we can be reassured that he will still be there, and so will his grace, for his grace is new every day. Something that we who have a tendency to get messy can all be thankful for. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you come looking for us when we are lost and when we are buried beneath the mess that we have made of our lives. We thank you that you don't tell us that we have to clean up ourselves and our lives first, but instead you meet us right in the middle of our mess. Help us to ignore the lies in our head and the whispered lies from the enemy that tell us we can never change. We come to you today and we bring you our mess. And we ask you for a refreshing drink of your living water, the grace that only you can provide. Amen.